So welcome. This is our end of the year roundup for 2020. It's January 1st, 2021. We made it. And uh, welcome in Chris Little, Scott Villeneuve from the Limited Slip blog. The usual are suspects are here. You've probably seen these videos in years past. We typically do them a little earlier in the month of December. We got to a little late this year. And of course, we're usually together, but we it's are a little different this year. Yep, we are together apart uh, via Zoom for obvious reasons, but uh, we wanted to recap our year as test drivers of cars. Those guys do the same things that I do, if you're not familiar with them. And uh, so how are things going at the Limited Slip Blog these days? It was a good year, Steve. We had uh, 52 cars this year, or, or last year now, um, you know, one car a week, which was great for us, uh, a lot of variety. Um, got to help you out a little bit this year. Remember the Alamo, Steve, uh, February, yes. our, our last travel together to go see the, uh, the Kia a, Seltos. Yeah, that was a fun time. That was a really fun time. That was almost a year ago, which is hard to believe. It's very hard to believe. Right before the world changed, basically. Scott, how are you? I'm doing all right. How's everything with you? I hear you purchased another new vehicle. Would you care to share that with us or is that private information <laughs> you want out um, yeah, I got a, uh, 2013, uh, M3. Yeah. I thought it was a 13 in the picture, I guessed. So that yep. was the last model year of the E92. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. And it's white. Yes, it is. And have you actually driven it yet? Or has it just been in the, ground? uh, I drove it from where they dropped it off to my garage. And it will come out in the spring. In the spring. Okay. <laughs> which around our parts is maybe like may <laughs> yeah we're hoping yeah. for we're hoping for april all right so i posed some questions to these two fellows the other day and uh we brought up some topics of discussion that i hope that you will find interesting i also drove less cars this year than normal due to a bunch of reasons but probably around the same i don't know 70 75 not the two a week i normally do due to COVID and other things, but somewhere around there, I would say. And of course, a lot of our typical events where we even drive more cars like the uh, Impa test days in the fall down at Monticello was canceled as were a lot of other events. So scaled down a little bit, but still lots to talk about. And so the first question I pose to you guys, and I don't, this was in no particular order, but something I think about a lot now because I sold my Tacoma back in February. And so I haven't had a car of my own in almost a year. And so I'm kind of shopping around out there. I'd like to get a truck replacement. And so what are the must have car features? If you were buying a car for yourself, why don't you guys list like three features that you think you need to have in a new car in order for you to be happy? Why don't we start with Chris? Steve, um, it, it's an easy one uh, for me, LED headlights. It's just such a massive step up um, you know, you mentioning your uh, Tacoma, Toyota has been slowly adding in LED headlights to their very SUV slow. and their trucks very slowly. Um, but I have a family member who sold his 2012 Tundra to buy a 2014 Tundra because of the new headlights, you mm -hmm. know, everything else unchanged. Um, but at night, the, 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 the change in headlights, uh, the illumination, I think is a must have in 2021. Yeah. And it's funny because I had the Toyota Hybrid XSE recently, which had the LED headlights and had the halogen fog lights, which is one of my biggest pet peeves. And leave it to freaking Toyota to still do it. <laughs> if it was going to be anybody, it was going to be Toyota, was it not? All right, Scott, what do you got for us? Um, so I, I kind of like the new rear view camera mirrors. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that's a great technology that they're coming out with. Um, and, and just where we live with the salt and everything like that, it's kind of nice to have that. You can see out the back window a heck of a lot easier. It's a love or hate relationship with those. I've noticed when other people who don't do what we do for a living get in these cars that have yep. them. Uh, Lance, for instance, my buddy Lance, who helps out on a lot of my videos, he hates them because he says it freaks him out with his eyeglasses, apparently, and he can't. Mm -hmm. is correctly on it for some reason sure but, yeah i agree with you i like those too i don't have any problem with them at all um and uh we'll just keep going around here because we're going to do three of these but one of them for me is i love the around view monitors 
And they have trickled down into some pretty yeah. inexpensive models recently. Some like low end, Nissan's great at it. They, I think they put it in almost everything. Low end cars like the Sentra and so forth. And I am like a parking nut, you know, like I like to make sure that my car is just so in every parking space. And, and, you know, if you're in a tight spot to have that backup camera, to know you can go that little extra inch in the back as you're reversing, I just think is awesome. Yeah. All right, Chris, what's next on your list? I'm a tech guy, Steve. I like, I like, um, you know, we get in a lot of cars and the amount of time it takes normally to pair your phone to, Bluetooth or to CarPlay or Android Auto, especially now with the wireless implementations, which I know you love. Mm. Um, uh, you know, having the, the NFC or the near field communication where you just tap your phone to the dashboard or wherever that, that little logo is in the car and you are instantly paired to the car uh, saves me a ton of time. Um, you know, I have a work phone and a personal phone, so I'm juggling multiple connections at a time. It just really cuts down um, on how hard it is to connect to the car. Yeah. And I think a lot of people probably aren't familiar with what you're talking about there, but there literally is a small symbol, usually on the dash somewhere yep. that makes that connection super fast and simple. GM is Hondas, great about Hondas it. have it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. How about you, Scott? What's next on your list? What's number two? Um, so I'm, I'm kind of a, a sucker for how a vehicle is laid out. So it's smart packaging. Like, when, we, when you think back, the Honda Fit was always a big thing for smart packaging. It had fit so much stuff in a little space. Um, this year, right? Exactly. Exactly. And you know, this year we drove the Hyundai Venue, which neither of us really loved, but was packaged really well. Like the inside of that car was bigger than you would think it was for the size of the actual car. Right. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that car, there are so many small cars out there now that just offer much more space than anybody yes. would imagine. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of people eliminate cars like that based on their appearance from their shopping list when they should really Correct. get some chance. Another car like that, <clears throat> Hyundai Kona, which I think yep. is a car that kind of plays big on the inside and small on the outside. For sure. Uh, and uh, number two for me, and uh, Chris alluded to this just a minute ago, you know, I love, I have an, I'm an iPhone <laughs> user. I'm always talking about my wireless car play. I don't know. I mean, people argue this with me, but when I get in a car, the first thing I do is connect my phone to the car, whether that be via a USB cable or whatever. I don't even care if it's a short trip around town. Like I want that connection. I want to be able to do my text messaging and my mapping and whatever else I want to do. I love that feature. And wireless car play is now showing up in more and more vehicles. Um, the cheapest of which that I can recall was the new Trailblazer I drove this year from Chevy. So it's come down there. I think it's a great thing. You just don't want to have to carry the cable around. It makes the cabin look messy with the cable. There's never a good place to stick the stupid thing. Um, however, I have noticed recently, and I don't know if it's an iOS issue with Apple or if there's some other problem, but um, the audio can sometimes be choppy. Uh, if you're playing back like a music streaming source from your phone to the head unit in the, in the car, um, it comes in and out. And I heard other people also commenting on my videos that that's happening to them. So I think there might be some sort of an issue there, but I love wireless car play BMW and mini pioneered it about four years or so ago. And now other companies are starting to catch up. All right, Chris, what do you got for number three? Well, it, Kind of an extension of that, Steve. I mean, I just drove the new Kia K5, which also had wireless CarPlay and Android Auto. Um, for me though, it's the widescreen implementation of those softwares. Um, you know, screens in cars are just getting bigger and bigger. And, you know, there are, there are some models that give you that one little rectangle of your phone overlay, but I've seen, um, you know, some of the newer models like the K5, the new Mazda 3, where they give you that widescreen format and you almost get two windows, right? You can have your navigation and also your Spotify or your Cirrus XM, um, or you can swap it around and have your contacts and your map um, at the same time. So you're getting more information. You're using more of that screen that you paid for. Um, and, and so the widescreen implementation of that throughout, um, I think is, is something that I must have. Yeah, and it's funny because Lexus has very wide screens in some of their new models. However, <laughs> they don't use the space. 
So there will be a song title that has is like six words in it. And you get the first three words and all this blank space. And I'm thinking, come on. I mean, how is that possible? But anyway, uh, for me, number three is an oldie but a goodie in my mind. And a lot of this uh, functionality has since transitioned over to smartphone apps, but it's remote start. And we live in a very cold part of the world here. And I love having that feature. I'm driving the Accord Hybrid right now, which has been refreshed for 2021. And it has remote start on the fob. I kind of appreciate it on the fob. Uh, a lot of companies have just put it on the smartphone app, but you can't beat remote start in the winter, if you ask me. I like a nice warm up car. All right, so now should I rearrange this or should we talk about this now? Because this is kind of the, the meat and potatoes of our discussion, our favorite test drives of, uh, actually, I, I, the way I posed the question to you guys was favorite test drive. I have a short list here. I'm just gonna run through these kind of quickly and then I'll turn it over to you guys. And when we say favorite test drives, we probably don't necessarily mean best per se. But for whatever reason, it was a car that appealed to us and we enjoyed driving it and it stood out and it made a memory. And that's why we're talking about it now. So I'm going to start off with the first one. I've got a little backstory on this one, which is kind of funny, which ties in you guys. But back in late January of last year, I was invited to a, a Genesis event in Miami for the unveiling of their new SUV. And I have a buddy that lives down there and it was surrounding the Super Bowl in Miami. And so I went down and Aston Martin set me up with a car and that was going to be available to me once I got off the airplane at the airport. And it was dark and it was night and the car was dark and I'm waiting out at the curb and the delivery company pulls up and I'm not that familiar with the Aston Martin models. I mean, and I was told it was going to be a Vantage, by the way, which is fine. You know, that would have been great. So I get in the car real quickly. I throw my bags in and I'm like, it's, I'm looking around. I'm thinking, this doesn't seem like, this doesn't sound like, this, everything just didn't seem quite right. So I got to this destination where I was heading about 20 minutes from the airport to meet up with my buddy for dinner. And I pulled up the car on the curb and I took a picture and I think I sent it to Scott. And I'm like, yeah. Scott, what am I, this isn't the Vantage. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, this is the DBS and you know, the super Legera, and this is the Volante. And I'm like, oh, geez, and like I'm driving like a $400,000 car. <laughs> Instead of getting their lowest end model, I got their highest end normal model. And um, so that was, that was a car that stuck out for me. Another lesson I learned on that trip is, is I don't know how people um, test drive cars in Florida. You know, I had my buddy Jimmy down there to help me shoot it. And I don't know, if, I'm sure there are car critics that are well known for being in that state. But where do you find roads down there? They're all as straight as an arrow. There are no hills. It was like, I kept telling my buddy, like, yeah, can you go out and help me find a curvy? And there just wasn't. There's just nothing. Everything is like this, which made no, it thanks. very boring. So, yeah. So I don't know how people do that down there. We're lucky. We live in upstate New York where we have awesome roads in four seasons, which I think, although it can be a hindrance at times, is generally, you know, better for the test driver. All right, so anyway, quickly, I'll go through these other ones real fast. The new Defender, awesome, love it. I love configuring the new Defender almost as much as I love driving. Going on their website, I mean, there are endless possibilities with that vehicle. There's so many cool accessories and features. Love the Defender. On a more reasonable scale, the new Nissan Sentra is awesome. Great little car, good for Nissan, a company that's really struggling right now. And they're trying to kind of rebrand themselves and, and go in a new direction. The Toyota Supra was a great test drive. Chris was there for that one. He helped out with that video. And the Supra, um, even though I'm a convertible guy and loved my Z test drive last year, I thought the Supra was awesome. Um, I thought it was a great job by Toyota slash BMW. The Acura TLX, which is a video I just posted recently that people seem to really be enjoying really blew me away. I mean, like that was, that's, that's what, that's the car, the TLX or the TL was always supposed to be. It is super fun to drive. Maybe not as fast as people would want it, but keep in mind the Type S is coming next spring. The Kia Seltos, which Chris and I went down to uh, Austin to drive last February. Really impressed with the Seltos. I mean, that's also Kia at its best. It was just more car than you would expect, which is kind of what Kia has become, giving you more for the money. 
The Chevy Trailblazer, very impressed with that, almost in the same vein as the Kia Seltos because it was so uh, affordable, stocked with features, cool looking, cool options. You know, I understand that using that name Trailblazer on a vehicle like that is going to upset some of these wackos out there. I don't care. Corvette convertible, uh, unbelievable car. The new C8 Corvette is everything you have heard it is and in more. Uh, at an unbelievable price. And the last car for me was the Porsche 911, the, the Carrera S with a stick shift. I had not driven a stick shift Porsche and I can't tell you how long. I think Chris got some seat time in that if I remember correctly. Yep. And uh, wow, I mean, that is like, that's why you want a manual transmission in certain cars. I'm not a big like save the manuals kind of guy, but in that car, that's exactly how I would want it. All right, so that's my list. Those are my favorite test drives for the year 2020. Scott, why don't we go to you next? Um, I have a shorter list, uh, but actually I'm going to piggyback off a couple of years. The, the Trailblazer was impressive. Um, really, that kind of goes back to that packaging thing because that car, for the money and what it had in it, lots of good stuff. Um, the Lexus LC500 Cabrio. I mean, you can't really go wrong with that car just because of the motor, you know, it's, it's a dying breed. Um, I, we just had an a 35 AMG. Uh, that was a great car, uh, kind of expensive for what it is, but fast little pocket rocket, small sedan kind of thing. It's kind of what we like. We had it on snow tires, which was kind of fun. And then, uh, my last impressive vehicle, I know you've driven the entire, uh, pretty much all of them, but the, uh, the new Escalade was impressive. Mm -hmm. Very impressive. Yeah. I'd agree with a lot of those. The, uh, just Chris, one moment here, the Lexus LC was probably, it's one of the most gorgeous new cars I've ever seen. Oh yeah. Yep. But the yep. ride on that, it just, I wanted it to be more of a sports car. And it's it, not a sports car. It's a grand touring car. I, I wanted it to be, even as a grand touring car, I just, I remember I took that on a, uh, a trip out to Cooperstown, which is about an hour and 10 to 20 minutes from here and a lot of great curvy roads. And I just kept wanting to feel connected to that car. And I was always just like, eh, it always looked better on a curb somewhere parked when you stepped out of it than it, than it felt when you were actually driving it. That's my, all right, Chris, what do you got for us? I don't know, Steve, I settled into that seat, kind of let the Lexus owner mentality take over me and <laughs> just kind of really enjoyed cruising around with the yeah. top down. It was beige inside after all. <laughs> all <right>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have to echo Scott on the Cadillac. I think really they've taken it to the next level. Um, yeah. You know, I was super impressed last year driving the new Navigator. This year, Cadillac, I, I think that the it's, it's worth the wait. Blew it away. I yeah. Blew it away. Totally. Yeah, they, that, that, that thing is awesome. But the, the one, and there's a little bit of a story behind this because it's kind of a weird pick for me, uh, but the Lincoln Corsair, uh, Corsair, we had a reserve trim with the 2.3 liter motor, which is the bigger optional optional motor. Um, and, and really it's not because of the drive because it's a luxury SUV. The drive was not impressive for someone like me who likes to drive, but um, it was just American luxury done as well as Lincoln can do it. It was comfortable. It was quiet. The sound system was phenomenal. It, it was for me, you know, after eight months of sitting at home, staring at the inside of my house, being in that car, just driving around, even without a destination, it was, it was my, it was an escape for me. Um, mm -hmm. And it was everything I wanted. Literally and figuratively. <laughs> hey, yeah, the pun, the pun was, the pun was intended, but you know, it, um, it, it, but it's, again, it's so much above the escape. I mean, Scott, you drove the escape, uh, titanium hybrid, I think. And did not like that at all. I drove the hybrid and my, my biggest problem with the escape is, is they turned it into the ugliest vehicle on the road. I mean, it used to look like a, a tough little rugged SUV and they smoothed out and they gave it that. Well, that's because they're, they have the Bronco sport now. Yeah. It's just hideous for me. The interior the, materials, it feels like the a rental interior is what killed that. That's the worst new car design this year, I think. They it, it was a, it was a backward. Really yeah, very disappointing. Ford didn't put a lot of effort into that one. No. What else, Chris? What else you got? 
You know, Steve, I liked the Supra. I wasn't super impressed. Um, you know, <laughs> I'll come back to it. I know there's a, a question coming up. I think I'm really interested to see what they've tweaked for 2021 to see if they've solved some of my complaints with that car. I've heard good things, uh, but just haven't had any, any seat time. Um, and I love and a we, manual. We didn't drive the two liter engine either, just to be clear. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So that was it, huh? That's your, that's your, that's your list. Is that your, cause that's the price of going last Steve, right? I mean, the <laughs> LC 500, the Escalade, <laughs> I threw 30 uh, cars in there, there, which is a weird pick for me. I'll, I'll admit. Well, I'll also say too, that I, I I've driven the suburban and the Tahoe and the Escalade and obviously they're all built upon the same platform and they're all awesome at what they do. I mean, those are really top-notch SUVs uh, done right. With the only caveat being when you get into the Tahoe and you're paying 80 grand or more, that interior was like, eh, it's, it's not there. It's like a 50 grand interior in an $80,000 car. But I have a feeling that people that buy that vehicle don't really care as much about that. So it's probably going to be overlooked. Yeah. Okay, least favorite. And I hate to continue to pick on Toyota and Lexus, but I drove a car recently and I haven't even produced this video yet. It's waiting for, for me to finish it. But I just drove the Lexus ES250 all-wheel drive F-Sport. Mm. I like the ES. I drove it when it was all new yep. a couple of years ago and it's an yep. excellent car. Yeah, definitely. This year, Lexus says, you know what? Why don't we offer all-wheel drive on it? But we're not going to give you all-wheel drive with the V6. We're going to offer a new four-cylinder engine, not a turbo, a 2.5-liter engine, basically from the RAV4, okay? We're going to put that in the car. We're going to give it a zero to 60 time of about nine seconds flat. And we're going to, call, we're going to put the F-Sport badge on it, right? Because that makes sense. The car looked pretty good. The interior, amazing with the red leather F-Sport yep. interior. But all, I mean, it was hands down the slowest luxury or premium car I have ever driven. Yep. And it was an embarrassment to put an F-Sport badge on that. And the only person that would want to buy that car that way would be like your grandparents. I mean, and I'm not saying every car has to be fast. I like luxury cars. They don't need to be speedy, but this was absurdly slow and just a poor combination of elements in that particular car that would make me go, you know, what the hell is Lexus doing with that? Yep. So anyway, that's my on, on the topic of absurdly slow. I'm throwing the venue in there. That car is unsafe in at at any actual speed. speed. Yeah. Well, no, no, <laughs> but like if you're merging onto the highway, I mean, zero to 60 in that thing's like 12 seconds. It's, it's pretty bad. Yeah. I, the Toyota, I mean, going back, the Toyota CHR, it was yeah. really refreshed this year. I've driven a couple of them. Again, painfully yep. slow, like 11 seconds to 60. Yep. The CHR's biggest problem in my mind is that they don't offer all-wheel drive with it. Yes. Yeah. That's dumb, especially up here. You don't have all-wheel drive up here. You're selling a niche car, really. That's basically what it comes down to. Um. What did you just say, Scott, that I wanted to talk about? Oh, yeah, the venue. Yeah, but if you're buying a $19,000 Hyundai venue, mm -hmm. you're going to have a different level of expectations than if you're buying a $53,000 Lexus ES. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I was just piggybacking off yeah. the uh, the slow Fire. factor because I, I think, I mean, you're not going to live in, you may live with that car in a city, but at some point you're going to need to get up to 60 <laughs> miles an hour, so... <laughs> it's just going to take you a long time. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, shall we go over to useless new car features? That was another topic I threw out to Scott and Chris. Sure. And um, I have a few. I'll just run through them quickly. Wi-Fi, which was a cool get maybe a few years ago. And as people who test drive the cars, it's cool to us, right? Like we're not paying the subscription price. It's great to jump in the car connected. But then you think like, well, if I'm the owner and I have like an unlimited plan for my family, why am I going to pay another $30 a month to Chevy or the, whoever their partner is in that crime? The wife, like it just doesn't make like, 
And they're still promoting it pretty heavily. Our car has Wi-Fi. Whoa. And I understand it's good for and necessary for over the air updates and other things the car is doing, but to actually have it as something to share with your family while you're in the car probably makes very little sense in 2021. Secondly, this isn't a new car feature per se, but one that I think is kind of outdated and it's the sunroof. Either you're going to have a panoramic roof or you're not going to have one. But when you get into cars now, like the Lexus ES, with a small little sunroof with the little flap I have to reach up and pull, it just feels old and cheesy. Yep. Next, USB-C outlets. Okay. I use an iPhone XS, okay? It's not the oldest iPhone in the world. Not the newest, but it's not the oldest. It's been around. I've had it for two years, right, when it came out. And iPhone uses a cable. And it plugs into a USB A outlet, I think it is, right? That's what they call right. Yep. So all these all these companies now are jamming in USB C, which seems progressive. But every time I get in one and everybody else that gets in them, you have to use an adapter or something. So can we pump the brakes on USB C until it becomes more standardized? I Next, know, Steve, maybe maybe you should just buy a new iPhone, Steve, because all of the iPhones are migrating to USB C. Yeah, they're um, migrating. Yes, uh, I understand. And, and some companies are good. I've so, had it. I've had USB C for for years. You know, I, I, hey, I'll I'll counter that with two things. One, the data rate transfer is higher. So if you're using Android Auto or CarPlay, you can pass data back and forth faster, um, and you can usually do uh, higher charging rates. Um, so so your phone. I'm not I'm not diminishing its its role, and I'm sure it is the future. But it just seemed like it was coming on a little soon. Some automakers are good. Some are giving you both, if you've noticed. Yep. Get the old one and the new one. But a lot of the cars, like the Volvos, it's all they have. Anyway, what I don't really gets me, Steve, is my, what really gets me is when you have a USB port for data and a USB port just for power. Oh yeah yeah yeah. And yeah. So you're looking around, you're like, which one do I plug yeah. my phone into? Which one do I charge? Come on, guys. And some cars give you like better icons than others for those. Like they'll actually show a little picture of it, you know, next yep. to the port. Uh, voice control. Everybody claims that their next generation of voice control is it's common language. You can just speak anything and it's going to understand what you're saying. And for the most part, that's totally not true. Um, I just had the Acura TLX with improved voice control. And I try out like easy stuff. Like I'll say like uh, tune to Sirius XM, you know, MLB network or something. It's like never right. It never gets it. And it's one of those things where I have no patience. If it doesn't get it right the first time, I'm out. And I'm just like, forget it. You can't get that right. What else can you get right? And the last one, and new, these are our, our useless new car features. I'm going to throw the hybrid in there. The hybrid powertrain is an outdated should be put to pasture, out to pasture technology. We have electrification now. It is obviously the future of the automotive industry. All the car companies are moving towards a fully EV lineup, some sooner than others. Every hybrid I drive just seems like I'm using old technology. I'm using the previous generation gaming console, uh, whether it's the Ford Escape hybrid whether it's the Toyota RAV4 hybrid, um, there's, there's, the, there's a, um, a sacrifice that you need to make with those cars. They're not as smooth, they're not as satisfying, and they're not as good as their gas-only counterparts. Yet, they always cost more. And you look at all these Teslas whizzing by you on the road and other you know EVs, and you're like, Boy, this just seems crappy and old, and I don't want it anymore. And I, so I have, I have moved on from the hybrid powertrain. I'd agree with you on that point. Other than plug-in hybrids, I think plug-in hybrids still have a niche. Yeah, I do too. Because those, those have, uh, you know, useful, yes, full hybrid. EV range and the ability to take it on a trip somewhere. Yes. Yeah. And and for around the town driving, it's like you're getting the EV experience. Correct. You know it's going to end at some point, but for the most part, unless you're traveling, you know, out of town, you're good. It's it's an EV all the time. So I agree. Exactly. All right. Who wants to go next with their useless new car features? I got a couple. All right. Go for it. All right. So um, I hate synthetic engine sounds. 
uh, any sort of performance car that pipes in fake audio, don't like it at all because there's no happy medium. It's, it's either way too much or none at all. So I, I, I don't like that at all. I, I despise the touchpad for any navigation system or infotainment. Okay. So here's my, here's my thing. And it's going to be short, very short rant. Make it a wheel or make it a touchscreen. Get rid of the touchpad. It doesn't work in any car. Acura, terrible. Uh, Lexus, terrible. Uh, the new Mercedes M Buck system. It's a touchscreen with a touchpad. Just get rid of the touchpad and make it a touchscreen. That's all you got to do. Plus, you got your little touch wheels on the on the uh, awesome. steering wheel for the Mercedes. Right. That's all I got to say about that. We'll move on. Last one for me, and this is more of a useless as in. It doesn't make any sense to have it, but it's here to stay, and that's ambient lighting in cars. Um, no. I like it. <laughs> I like it. I know you were with me with the I touchpads. But I, I know you. Do. I know you do. But you're into all the gimmicks and stuff like that, so it's fine. <laughs> but um, it it's distracting if you have it turned up too high. Um, Mercedes is definitely the worst I've seen with that because you can turn it up way too high uh, and it reflects in the windshield and stuff like that. I don't like driving at night period, but you know, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, that's my, that's my last one. I knew that one was going to send you over the edge. So it does. Cause I, I love ambient. Light. I know you do. The more choices, the better. I like <laughs> the food settings. I love all that stuff. Mercedes and does. Yeah. I know. I know. Sorry. Chris. All right. Bust out your tinfoil hats. Cause I'm going big brother with this one. I hate driver attention monitors. Subaru is the worst. You cannot, you know, the new legacy, the new Outback, you cannot take your eyes off of in front of you for five seconds until the car is yelling at you. I feel like I'm driving with my mother in the passenger seat all the time. It's awful. The, the next one is um, passive voice activation. Uh, we had a Mercedes the, with the new Mbox system, the GLC mm -hmm. 63, right? It's listening for you to say Mercedes, just like Alexa is listening for you to say Alexa. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we bring, you know, we, we drive these new cars. We're talking about them a lot. I can't tell you how many times I had a passenger in the Mercedes and I'm talking about it and I say Mercedes and the car interrupts everything and goes, how can I help you? What, you know, what would you like me to do? Stop listening to me. Stop watching me. I am in control. Uh, so, so that's my big brother rant about new, new tech. You're really going to hate life in about five years. I know, I know, I know. The no, last can... one, uh, I'll we add can... one more because I personally don't need it and it annoys me every time it reminds me. Um, but rear seat reminder. Yeah. I almost put that on my list too. Why? If you, can't if you know? can't remember, you got your kids back there. Yeah. <laughs> Why can't it know that I haven't opened a rear door? You know yeah. what that is, though. Unfortunately, that's the lawyers saying put it in. Oh, absolutely. It's the marketing department saying, "Hey, we'll sell this as a really cool new feature," but they're just protecting their asses so they don't get sued. Right. But you know, Chris brought up a good point, uh, especially with the Subaru. Oh my God! And it's funny, Subaru people. I mean, if you want to look at bad comments about my videos, <laughs> go to like the Outback videos and stuff. Oh my gosh, they hate me. They absolutely hate me. And because uh, I hate that intrusion, like it's nice to have some of those features, those safety features. But with the Subaru, it's like, boom, in your face all the time, hard to disable, can't shut it off. And it is like it's over the top annoying. It's militant. It is. It is. <laughs> I can't stand it either. Yeah, I agree with you on that. 100 percent. OK, so there are a lot of new cars that are due out in 2021 supposedly, if they can actually get their act together. A lot of cars have been delayed due to COVID and supply issues and that sort of thing. And so, uh, you know, who knows when we're going to see the first new Hummer, you know, will it be next year or will it be two years later? Who knows? Or uh, Bronco is delayed until what end of next year or uh, end, next summer rather. So, so I made a short list of cars that I was looking forward to. And, uh, 
the Bronco is one. Not because I'm like a Bronco guy. I don't have. I any... think that's a universal yeah. car for all of us. It's on my right. list too. But I, I don't want to just say like I, I don't have like I didn't used to drive them. I didn't have posters of them. I'm just curious, like if it's as cool as it looks. That's what I want to find out. Uh, the TLX Type S, because the TLX A spec is so good, that T that Type S is going to be awesome. I would think. But it's um, got a touchpad. What's that? But it's got a touchpad. <laughs> yeah, that does. Yeah, oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's not good. Uh, the 2021 Ridgeline. Now, this is a controversial one because oh, no. people don't like the Ridgeline. If you're a male, it's not cool to like the Ridgeline. But the Ridgeline is a great lifestyles truck for those who don't need body on frame, four low kind of workhorse stuff. Okay. So if people aren't familiar, they're updating the Ridgeline for the 2021 model year. I think it's due out this month, if I'm not mistaken, maybe next month. And they've toughened up the look a little bit. They've got the Honda performance division stuff, like all of their accessories that are now available, including some gold wheels, which I don't love, but whatever. And um, could possibly be a replacement for my Tacoma. I was just going to say, don't lie to the consumer, Steve. You already have your name on one. <laughs> I would like to get one. They're pricey. They're very pricey. But I just like that. That, that truck would suit me. That would be fine for me. I don't need other things. And then to have the Honda name behind it goes a long way with me. Honda is one of those brands I just like, I trust. I trust that it's going to work and I love their engines. Uh, and then another truck that I've been waiting for ever since I saw it debut at whatever auto show we were at, however many years ago, is the Hyundai Santa Cruz. Their new lifestyles pickup, which I think is going to be even smaller. And I know there are some spy photos out there of it already being tested. So I don't know when it's due out, but sometime in this year, looking forward to that. And then at the luxury end of the spectrum, I would like to see what the new S class holds. You know, I'd like to drive that and see, you know, how crazy did Mercedes go uh, with the self-driving tech and stuff in that. That's my list. What about you guys? All right. I, who's going? Let me go. You got to go first last time. Fine. Uh, so one of the one of the cars you got to drive, Steve, that we didn't is the new Corvette Stingray. Um, you know, I can't wait to get behind the wheel of that next year. Uh, once once we kind of come out of the thaw, um, we alluded to it earlier. The revised Toyota Supra, the 3.0. I I'm really interested to see what they what they do with that. Um, and then the the you you talked about the Bronco already. So I'll say the new Golf. GTI and, uh, and Golf R, um, you know, new platform. We just drove uh, 2020, so the last model year of the current Mark 7 generation. Um, it's a car that does everything right. It's really good at being a driver's car, an everyday driver. Um, I, I really can't wait to see what they do with the new one. Hmm. All right, I guess that means it's my turn. Um, so yeah, Bronco, obviously, Corvette, obviously. Um, I actually, some people have driven it already. I'm looking forward to the Veloster N with the DCT. Mm. Uh, I think that that'll be an interesting car and the updates they made to that this year. We had a Veloster N. Was that two years ago, Chris? Yeah. Now at this point? Yeah. yeah. We, we like that a lot. It was a fun little car. I like small, fast cars. Um, that is a great car. That is yeah. a great car. Yeah. I, I also uh, I also agreed with you on the um, S class. I think that's going to be a tour de force there. Mm -hmm. um, I am also interested in the new CT5 Blackwing. Mm. I think that'll be an interesting car. Uh, see how far they can bring that. I mean, Cadillac's always done chassis as well. Hopefully, they can get everything going with that. Um, I mean, that one's got to be good because the CT5 V series was just mediocre. We'll get to that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we got to we got to get there first. And then I uh I'm curious to see what the new F150 is going to be like. Yeah. I've got one of those scheduled uh next week. I think. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I think uh I think we're right after you. Oh, well there you go. And the Mach-E. So. I forgot to mention the Mach-E. I want to drive Maki. No, 
I, think I, it, I mean, I. It's okay. It's okay. I saw it in person. I was there in New York City for the day after reveal. I think it was in November of nineteen or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I was really impressed with the product presentation and just the look of it and and everything. And uh, yeah, we'll see. You know, I got to walk around, Steve. I think it's well thought out. Maybe one of my least favorite new car features is reusing old badges. Trailblazer, Mustang. Yeah. I mean, come on. It's not a Mustang. They're doing it for marketing. It's, it, it, it has more brand recognition. There's a guy we follow on Twitter who will remain nameless who's very upset about the Mustang. I know. And I will not say who it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's an inside joke that uh, is now outside. <laughs> You know, yeah, I know people get all worked up over that sort of thing. I don't know. I, I for some reason, I just, I don't know. It doesn't bother me, man. I don't know. Maybe it should. <laughs> and it doesn't, it, it doesn't. And it doesn't depends on the car for me. So that's pretty much, you know, where I left the questions, but I was thinking of a couple of others and uh, you know, 90% of the viewers have long since left the room. <laughs> so we might as well just continue talking. See how long, you know, maybe somebody's on a long train ride somewhere and they got... Well, you didn't, you didn't get to our disappointments. Did I? Oh, didn't I? No. Yeah, you talked about yours, but I don't, I don't think you asked us about ours. Oh, geez. Well then... I'm disappointed in that, Steve. (laughs) Go for it. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, You're going to talk about the CT5, so I'll talk about the Volkswagen Passat. (laughs) <laughs> the refreshed 2020 Volkswagen Passat. What a phone in that was. The styling is boring. The ergonomics are bad. I mean, the steering wheel's off. It's a German car. Come on, guys. It's got off brand, low rolling resistance tires that are just, they give up the ghost so early. Uh, the drive was uninspiring. And then, you know, they had the wherewithal to, to follow the trend of the like block wide lettering on the back. So now, Passat takes up half of the trunk. I, I, I was so disappointed in that car. I mean, come on, Volkswagen. What was that? I know you're killing it off. You know, yeah. I know you want us to all go buy the Arteon, but what was that? Nobody's buying the Arteon. And the Arteon was just refreshed, and I just saw one in my neighborhood the other day. Yep. Which is, that is a rare sighting when you see one of those around. Yes, it is. It's a good looker, but it that's a cool looking car. Yeah. Yeah, Volkswagen in general just, they struggle with a lot of things, unfortunately. They've got a lot of good attributes, but boy, they, they, it's rare that they bring the complete package to the table. I liked the Atlas, and, and I know yeah. Scott didn't like it, but I didn't mind the Atlas Cross Sport. I like the Atlas, and I like the Tiguan too. I don't like the Cross Sport. I like the regular Atlas. Yeah. Cross Sport right, was kind of pointless. Talk about the Cadillac. Like that you hate in 2020. Oh, uh, well, I'm going to add, I, I, the CT five V was my biggest disappointment of the year. Yeah. Um, and, and here, and the, the biggest reason is because Cadillac had a name, a brand in place. They got rid of it. Mm-hmm. So they had a V sport previously call this a V sport. If you called it a V sport, I think I would have been even better with it. Right. Don't call it a V. It's not a V. V's have, V's are your top of the line performance cars. Don't call it that. So that's my biggest thing. And the car itself for what it was, I mean, it wasn't that inspiring. It was like the chassis was good, but I don't like the fact that you can adjust brake feel and steering and suspension and like, Yes, you have a V mode for that, and then you have a completely individual mode, but I don't think any car should offer brake resistance or brake response adjustability. I just don't think that's a thing. Like, make it one thing. It, yeah. It's brakes, you know. Don't – your muscle memory of the last 10,000 miles is this, and then you change it the next day, and then you're slamming into the back of somebody, you know. So – um so that's my biggest disappointment. Uh, and then my second is going to be the Supra. I, I didn't like the Supra at all. Um, and it comes completely down to the suspension architecture in that car. I know they updated it for the next year. Uh, the rear end was just not 
I, I don't like going over mid corner bumps and going sideways. So that's just, that's just my thing. I know we agree to disagree on the Supra. I will say, I think it's really bad Toyota, you know, for a, to, to design a car where you can't drive with the windows down. We had that car. Oh, God. oh yeah, that's right. I forgot I about mean, that. That's yeah. just a, you, you can't do that in this day and age. Yeah, Going no. back to the Cadillac. You can't, yes, it's got a good chassis. You know, we drove it in late October, November. It was on the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tires. There was snow on the ground. That, the car wasn't really set up for success, but man, to have a sports car that sounded so fake with such a dead steering oh. wheel, I mean, just, it, it just missed the mark as a, as a yep. V or even a V whatever, you know, it just didn't. Call the V Sport. The, CT, the CTS V Sport from like three years ago was a way better car. I, I agree. Yeah, and, and, and Cadillac continues to screw themselves over with all these name changes. Like you said, they had a V-Sport line, and then they decided, well, we're going to call this the V-Series now because we have this upcoming Blackwing thing going on, but not the Blackwing V8 you knew from the CT6. <laughs> like, I mean, and, they, and then now you're hearing that they're going back to actual naming of their cars, uh, getting away from the alphanumeric stuff. So yeah, Cadillac is in a world of hurt. I mean, I know yep. their goal right now is the transition to um, electric vehicles. And a lot of their dealers are taking buyouts of up to yep. like $1 million to get out. Um, I think Cadillac's, I don't hurting. know. Yeah, they're hurting. They're hurting. They're in trouble. Which was another question I was going to ask before we started to talk about this. Like, what brands do you guys think are uh, pointing in the upward you know, direction? And what brands do you think are, or you're going in the op off. I think Genesis is poised to have a big year. I, I really like their. Yes, they have no dealer network. Nobody well, even knows yeah. who Genesis is. Nah. Nobody the problem. It's going to be a problem, but I think that their products are, are, are really nice. They um, are. I think they're really well thought out. They've got the, you know, Hyundai technology build behind them. So you, you get a lot for your money. Um, you know, I think Kia, Hyundai, Genesis are all are all on the rise. Um, going in the other way, uh, the the brand we don't talk about at all, Mitsubishi. Oh, <laughs> I mean, they've been going that way for years. There. Yeah, the that's... second they killed the Evo, that they were gone. Yeah. Um, I think I think I agree with Chris. I think Hyundai uh, Motor Group is going up. Uh, going down, JLR. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, I don't, I think they're like, they just don't have any sales. They're trying to sue German manufacturers for their technology uh, that they stole from them. Uh, yeah. Trying to stop sale cars. It's yep. just, it, it's not a good look. Yeah. I don't know about uh Jaguar Land Rover. I, I love their it. sales <laughs> numbers. They're not great. Yeah, I know. I know the sales are not good, and so from that perspective, I, I can't argue with you. But um, what do they have coming? I mean, the new Range Rover is what next year. Uh, yeah, they've got a new Range. That's about it. They're, they're taking like to an even higher level of presence, like a like a luxury, like a a big deal kind of thing. Um, but I, I, you know, how about the new XJ, the electric XJ that apparently is in the works? That's I mean, I don't know. The uh, they were pretty quick to the game with the I pace, which I don't for whatever reason. Do you, do you why doesn't that sell? Do you have any idea? It's too expensive. Well, it's it's too expensive for what it is. As compared to what though? I mean, it's an electric SUV. People are going to buy a Model E or uh, Model Three, Model Three, Model Y. They just the, the 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 infrastructure, at least around here, for charging is the issue. I think. Because yeah. you got plenty of Tesla chargers, but you don't have many right. non-Tesla. Right, right. That's true. Um, you know, an interesting brand to watch is Mazda. They've been going through their premium evolution over the past two years. Price points ticking up. Models are higher. Mazda speed long since gone. Uh, they've got their signature lines now on the 6 and the CX-9. The CX-30 was an excellent new addition this year. I thought it really hit the sweet spot between the, the three and the five. Um, but I think Mazda is going to be in, in a world of hurt. I don't think Americans associate Mazda with premium. Nope. 
know that takes time, that journey. But um, there's a lot of things about Mazda that I think are going to prevent them from succeeding. And I have a feeling that I wouldn't be surprised in a year or two if you hear they're dumping the whole premium thing and going back to their roots, which yep. was always been motorsports, you know, big time. Those guys are, if you know the Mazda people, they're all racers. And oh, so yeah. I bet you they're even turned off a little bit by the direction they're going because they're probably not as emotionally involved in the product as they used to be. And um, I was very disappointed with the three sedan that I drove. I thought the hatchback was much more intriguing for different reasons. But um, I think Mazda is a brand to, to kind of watch and be worried for a little bit. I'll add one more. Um, less so Nissan, much more Infinity. Infinity oh, is Infinity's not cool. doing well. Cool. Got they got it. nothing. They've got that QX55. And the QX50 didn't sell well. Right. Total disaster as far as the small SUV that was supposed to bring them into a, a new SUV world. Whole reason yeah. is the is the center infotainment. Absolutely. Guaranteed. Yeah. It's atrocious. Well, and then the 55, they're expecting that just to because it's, you know, basically a coupe style variant of that with the same powertrain with their variable compression turbo. Oh. They think that's going to be the answer. I don't think so. I don't either. They've got an updated QX80 coming. They've, uh, can you still buy a Q70? Uh, no. The Q70's nope. gone? Yeah. It's Q50 only and Q60. Hmm. Well, that's, that's a problem then. Yeah. Yeah. And Nissan in itself, I mean, obviously they're going through alliance issues. Yes. With no and Mitsubishi and they hear rumors that they're trying to get out of that deal. And I mean, who, you know. And of course, Infinity now, they're, they're, they're saying their executives have called it a Nissan Plus brand. So they are no longer going to try to compete at that premium level with, say, Lexus. They just want to be a slight step up from Nissan so you can kiss those rear wheel drive architectures completely goodbye. And uh, not good. Just, just That'll kill them. The new Nissan Z, put a manual in it, and you know I'll personally be happy. It's not going to save the company, but... Um... A Nissan did, Z is not going to save the company. Why did none of us say Nissan Z, by the way, when we were talking about cars looking, we were looking forward to driving? I, you know, is it too early to think know. about it? Because it's not real yet? It's probably it. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of ugly. And frankly, I, again, there's another car that I can appreciate the um, enthusiasm for, but it never has really spoken to me in a way that I crave to drive. I've driven a million of them, convertibles, coupes, blah, 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 sticks. Don't you know. get him going. Why, Crip? Oh, that's right. Oh, I've that's got right. a family history with the Z. That's right. Hey, no, I get it, right? But, you know, cars are that way. You have a car that you love and you don't see around it. Um, you know, there are, must there are plenty <laughs> of Mustang and Camaro fans out there that I'll give a hard time to. But hey, I get it, right? The Z is my car. Um, you know, would I buy one today? No. You know, do I have fond <laughs> memories of, of it and the brand and the experience? Sure. You know, what, what can I say? Yeah, for sure. I understand that. I mean, that's kind of the way I was with, uh, you know, some of the vehicles my parents grew up driving. And, you know, you kind of have that heartstring moment with some of those vehicles, you know, but they don't necessarily make sense. And then you realize it's nothing like what it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at you, M3 and M4. <laughs> I'll tell you, that M440i I drove, <laughs> despite what you may think of the appearance of that car, was a phenomenal car. But it, and it's not trying to be what it used to be when it was a 3 Series Coupe. I mean, right. it's a different persona, but man, it's, it's, it's a nice car. It's a very, very well done car, yeah. in my opinion. The other brand the I'm worried best, about? The, the, yeah. I was going to say, the other brand I'm worried about is Aston Martin. You know, their niche, they don't make a ton of cars. They're expensive. They've had financial issues, but their product lineup, other than the new DBX SUV, which we'll see how that works out for them. Steve, you and, I too drove, good so far. you and I drove the Vantage. It was underwhelming. You, got, you drove the Mercedes AMG GT. Are uh, mm -hmm. in that green that your your sister loved. 
um, and, and, which is underneath, right? That's the same powertrain. I think looking back at your two videos, you'd take uh -huh. that one every day of the week. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I did like that, but I, I didn't, I thought the Vantage was solid. My biggest issue with Aston Martins are their interiors are just, I mean, they're, 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 they're not up to the standard of the price they're, they're asking. It's a high bar, right? When you're, yeah. when you're asking six figures for a car, you've got to live up to that expectation. I get it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the biggest misconceptions for people that don't do what we do, which is just about everybody. You get them into these high level cars and they expect that the features and the content in these high level cars, 300, 400, whatever, are going to be like the best. And it's almost just the opposite of that all the time. It's these small niche car companies can't afford the R&D to make those interiors. I mean, you could argue that there are definitely some Kias and Hyundais that have more modern features and nicer uh, options than like a high-end Aston Martin, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes, I drove, had the most awful old Mercedes infotainment setup that was, I couldn't believe it was in there. It's two things. It's, it's the technology, right? You can get as much or more in a $28,000 Kia than you can in the, the new Vantage. Um, and then even the, right, the attention to detail only goes so far. And I think when we talk about Lexus, you know, you talked about the ES interior, um, you know, you, the attention to detail, the materials, the, the craftsmanship, how it's put together rivals, you know, an Aston Martin and a high-end Mercedes. Um, yep. you know, so, so it's hard to distinguish yourself if somebody who owns a Lexus gets into a Mercedes G wagon or an Aston mm -hmm. Martin and they go, Hey, this is not much different than my ES right. or my grandmother's ES. Right. Yep. Yeah, I always love that when you see like, you know, you, you get into a Hyundai Kia, right? It's going to have like heated rear seats, heated and ventilated front seats, memory settings. And then you get into, you know, like an $80,000 car, like, oh no, I, I, I don't have that in this car, you know, whatever is missing. And it's, it's always a surprise, especially to people that aren't familiar with how this stuff kind of works. But uh, yeah, weird. So we've taken up enough people's time. How long has this run? Does anybody know? We've been here for 90 minutes. Yeah, probably something like that. Well, that's great. I hope people really enjoyed our discussion of uh, all things automotive 2020. We shall, we shall see. Yes. I think last year's video picked up at least 1700 views. So if we get like 1800 <laughs> or 1900 this year, I think we're really doing something guys, <laughs> but you know what we should do? You know, this, this is fun. And uh, we can all meet up like this on Zoom. Maybe we should make this a more frequent thing and we can talk about more current topics. Okay. We like, no. <laughs> <laughs> How much are you going to pay us, Steve? Yeah, right, 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 right. Well, thank you, we everybody. We do it out of the kindness of our hearts. What's that? We just do it out of the kindness of our hearts. Yes, yes. <laughs> like everything that goes on with my business. <laughs> <Basically>. <laughs> Nobody really makes any money, not even me. What are you doing tomorrow? I need help. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I got this Accord hybrid, see, that uh, yeah. we're up, a cup, uh, up against a couple of snowstorms here. So that'll yeah. be fun. Um, so anyway, thank you for uh, coming to my channel. It's uh, been a pleasure. And Happy New Year to you all out there and to uh, Scott and Chris from Limited Slip Blog. Thank you. You guys are really the only people I endorse. Other than, uh, yeah, no, really, that's about it. That's frankly. <laughs> well, that I mean, says a lot. Steve. Another video reviewer. There's a couple people I like, uh, but most of them I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this has been fun. And nobody will watch that part of this video, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so maybe we'll see you guys back out on the uh, trail at some point. Like, uh, what, New, New York Auto Show is in August, I think, and Chicago Auto Show is yet to be determined, and who knows what happens. when I see it. Something like that. Yeah, something like I that. I think the auto show is dead, sir. Yeah, the auto shows will probably not happen much beyond this. At least not mm -hmm. like we're used to. When is nope. Detroit? Wait a minute. So New York's August, right? When is Detroit supposed to be? June? Is that right? I don't think they know anymore. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. There's probably no hope of really any of them happening, frankly. No. But I don't know. That's I've written them off completely. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right, guys. And uh, let us know what you think. Give us your favorites. Give us your least favorites. Give us whatever you want to give us, and we'll take a look. All right, guys. We'll see you later. Happy New Year, everyone. Bye. Happy New Year. Bye. Bye.